Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Time is now seven o'clock here in London and uh, midnight in Bangladesh, half past 11 in India. So many thanks who have already joined in this unique session of world poetry. As you know, this session is featuring some wonderful voice, some phenomenal poets of this time. And as you know, the aim of this event is to stay in association with you while you are self-isolating. And the power of art is benefiting you in so many ways. And it's lovely to have wonderful feedback from audiences all around the globe. Poetry lovers, music lovers, uh, you are leaving so many comments, so many beautiful, inspiring comments, and that is helping us, that is motivating us to continue with this session. And many thanks to the poets, writers, philosophers, and uh, performers all around the globe who are passionately supporting this session, participating, contributing this session in many meaningful ways. So thanks to all of you who also have already joined and perhaps will join uh, different, at the different points of this session now. So this session is streaming from streaming live from Grunthi's page, uh, as you know, Grunthi's page, and this is also available. This should be available in my page as well, my profile page, and it will be available in our poets page very soon. Uh, so please, please join and listen to the beauty of spoken word. Uh, witness the breathtaking uh, beauty, hypnotic beauty of uh, spoken word performances. And I'm delighted to have some wonderful poets of this time as part of the series today. Let us start with a poet, Argentine poet, Gerald, Geraldine Mac Barney Jones. I will introduce uh, one after another. So Geraldine, many thanks for joining and welcome to today's session. Uh, you are on mute, Gerald, you are on mute. If you kindly unmute yourself, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, uh, many thanks for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm very happy to be in here. Great. Uh, we do have so many audiences uh, uh, who perhaps have huge interest in Latin American poetry. Latin America is always famous for a phenomenal movement, magic realism, or, I mean, perhaps Carpentier, Juan Rulfo, Marquez made it more and especially Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, one of my favorite poet and uh, fiction writer. So they made this movement so phenomenal. And that's why perhaps uh, Latin American people, the audiences who are watching, uh, they must have huge interest in Argentine poetry too. We will come back to you soon again. Gerald, let me introduce other poets. Becky Cherryman, many, many thanks, Becky, for joining and welcome to today's session. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Thank you, Becky. Laura, we have Laura today. Laura Potts, Laura was featured uh, perhaps another session last month or before, so, you know, month before the last one. Many thanks, uh, Laura, for joining again and welcome to today's session.
And can you hear us, Laura? Uh, yes, a little. Uh, perhaps you, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, only problem with the uh, only problem with the uh, uh, Zoom. If you don't, uh, we are on speaker mode now. So if you don't speak, perhaps your face will not appear uh, here. So many thanks for joining, Laura. And Vera was uh, featured as part of the series before. Uh, many thanks, Vera, for joining again. A British uh, Ukrainian poet and an actor and a filmmaker as well. Vera, many thanks for joining. Welcome to today's session again. Uh, you are on mute, Vera. Sorry, yes, hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Vera. Uh, and we have another Argentine poet, but today, uh, I would be really happy if she could uh, uh, interpret uh, or uh, introduce Gerald uh, today and some uh, Spanish poems from Gerald today. As part of this panel, Gaby Sambucity, a wonderful friend of mine, a wonderful Argentine poet, Gaby Sambucity, many thanks for joining and welcome to today's session. Hi, many thanks everyone. I'm very honored to be here today and I'm very excited and looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Gaby. Uh, did we all find the link okay? Just to make sure before we start uh, uh, performing, before we start performance, did we find live streaming going okay in the Facebook? All of us here? Gaby, Vera, Laura, we can leave our personal. Can anyone tell us whether the live streaming going okay? And did you manage to? Gaby, did you find it okay? Have we all found it okay? Great. Yeah. So this is streaming live. Uh, many, many thanks. So please do leave your comments who are watching. Uh, we will try to place if you have any request or if you have any feedback to, to poets. Let us start with Gerald. So Gerald McBarney Jones was born in Gaiman Chubut in Argentina in 1984. She's a poet and a lawyer graduate, graduated from the Catholic University of Cordoba. She published Vestal de Luna in 2012 Cancun para an alma and willow, and Garmin o esa Veza music de name, another name of the book. Uh, please excuse my uh, pronunciation in 2019. Her poems were selected for the anthologies Patagonia Lateraria, poetry anthology of Southern Argentina. Uh, which is University of Patagonia and Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, Germany. So Shahar, number of poetry, number of poems have been published in many, many different anthologies and many, many thanks, uh, Gerald. Let us start with a, a performance. Let us start with reading. So what are you reading uh, as, as, the start, as the start of this session? Uh, will you like me to read in English or Spanish? Is yeah. First of all, if we, if we start with the English one, okay. uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to other points. Okay. Um, stay green. Never mind the machine whose fuel is human souls. Live large, man, and dream small. Um, this is from a poem from Aris Thomas, a uh, Welsh, um, Welsh poet. Believe me, the color of desire is like a blood shell and its bit is a necklace where men write their days with mercury wings. Go messenger to the cities where the flocks Awake weary and the stars chew oil a smoke. Can you see the sky blacked out? But you are unable to look 
into what you have been lent. And destiny seems a melted stream spouting from a looking glass. Come to the shadows. Look at the flowers betraying the machines. Lord the trees leaking leaves and embroider your scars with you. Listen. Listen to God speaking silently while he makes us of night and dreams and terror. Thanks. Can you have another one? Yes. <laughs> Get out. Thank you. Thank you. I lean far out from the bones bow, knowing the hand I extend can save nothing of you but your love. Um, this is from R.S. Thomas as well. Um, this is my poem. Right. Home. I think of you going through blue woods, surprised to find you silent, wearing your legs out while the sun leans its head on the green, green mountains. Now, the dusk is a mongrel dust of fact and fiction. It does not matter. By now, you will be watching the insects hovering like a freak under a new skin. Your mauve wings may be sailing into the night like bird needles. Do they call these things stars, glazed pebbles suspended from the sky? But I prefer to think that it is you, the steep sunlight of the mountains, a steam song breathing through the chestnuts, a crumbled space to rest and cease. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gerald. We'll come back. Exactly, fantastic. We'll come back to you again uh, and talk along with performance. We need to ask you something as well, but let us, uh, have uh, let us go back to Becky Cherryman. Becky Cherryman is first uh, in this series, uh, like Gerald. So Becky Cherryman is a writer, workshop leader, and performer who works part time in creative writing at the University of Leeds and part time with communities. Her poems have been published widely including by Serene, the North Moving Worlds journals, <clears throat> Bloodex, Becky's Sabotier Award, long-listed poetry pamphlet, Ecolocation and Collection uh, Empires of Clay were released in 2016 with Mother's Milk, Mother's Milk Book and Cinnamon Press respectively, respectively. Her poetry has won various prizes, including in the 2019 Women's Poetry and Ilkley Open Mic Competition. How come I miss this wonderful poet? Uh, I went to Ilkley Festival. I'm quite regular to Ilkley Festival. Many, many thanks, Becky, for joining as part of the series today. Let us start with poetry, your point. I think I'll start with, Geraldine um, had some beautiful um, eco-poetic uh, poetry um, and poems that connected with a lot with nature. So I'll start with this. This is Surprise of Barn Owl um, and it's, it's inspired partly by a, a local poet actually called Greg White, um, his poem Taking the Wheel and mm -hmm. by my own experiences. Now that his adulthood has been revoked by the DVLA, 
you drive us home in granddad's old red micro. Took months for him to relinquish his license, so things had long been appearing that weren't. A tiger in the garden, men moving around the house at night, the angel on his cheek. Today, after patiently dissolving paranoia into mugs of tea, hearing him affix the wrong names to objects, or worse, to us, I get why you were reluctant to accept this gift. You are cautiously gearing into adulthood, taking in what's around you like the black rabbit at the roadside. I draw in my breath and you slow, its shiny blackness burnished with meaning. Easter, Easter. An hour ago, your little cousins were hunting foil wrapped eggs in Grandad's garden while he sought out his wallet, a memory of a sunstruck holiday with his wife. I hate myself for failing to decode his sentences for not being wise enough to unpick what is troubling you. I didn't know till now that your worst fear is being forgotten, that this is why you find it hard to be around him. Drive on. Surprise of barn owl in headlights. Its third eyelid shifts side to side. Owls can see into the dark nights of our lives. They know things. Son, these lessons are hard. The corner's sharp. Don't travel too fast. Give other drivers their space. Remember your stopping distance. And for mirrors. We eye one another for moments only. Rabbit, owl, you, me, granddad, all of us, mysteries, all searching for them turning back to the road and what comes after. Thank you. Can I have another? Becky, can you have another? another? Wonderful. Great. This, this, exactly. is, um, this is something, um, I'm writing a lot more experimental work at the moment and uh, this is wow. beginnings and it's, it's in the eco- we'll, 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 we'll try to, wow. Exactly, fantastic. We'll try to explore about your experimentation as well. That is important uh, to keep the flow poetry going because unless the new dimension is created, everything gets monotonous actually. So, but we'll try to explore about this. But let us have another. Call. Oh, okay. can we have the? Uh, can we just show the audiences the cover that you showed, perhaps? Uh, I'm not sure the audience is watching it. If you talk a bit, Becky, then uh, the speaker will go to you. Then this. Okay. Can you? Exactly. Yeah. So it's a yeah, stand produced in Leeds. Um, Thank it, you. It's becoming, it's after the sculptures of Giuseppe Pinone at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So I'm like you, Ahmed, I'm interested in, in collaboration, and um, I know Vera is as well. Um, the Cummings. The skin of tree is on the inside. The beginnings of its branches whirls of concentric circles pushing out through joints. Inscribed within my trunk, the signatures of people I have met are ripples in time as well as space. How we hang our experiences makes them more than magnified fingerprints, more than psoriatic bark. We are not just seeing the tree, but the air around it, all these waves. Has Ahmed disappeared? Oh no, that never happened uh, <laughs> in the past. <laughs> I think because I watch a lot of these series and I never ever experienced Ahmed like disappearing. Um, well, I guess, I guess you can read another one. Like I will, 
<laughs> I will replace him until he's back. Um, Becky, that's a very nice uh, cover. I really like it. Um, the, the, the cover that you show before is really nice. So it's edited by, uh, this particular edition was edited by Vani Capilgio. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a lovely, um, lovely journal. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, would you like to share another poem? I'll do, I'll do one more. Okay. This is Marston after the flood. And uh, I had a friend who, who was flooded. So in West Yorkshire, uh, we have a lot of floods. And um, in recent years, it's uh, Hebden Bridge area has been affected a lot. And one of my friends lost everything in, in, in her flat when, um, when there were floods. And at the same time, I was going through a little bit of a crisis in my own life. And when I met up with her, I wrote this. I find her at Imbolc, despite the dark and the crowd that gathers in it, marked out by her staff of stalls, fairy lights, rosary beads from her grandmother, the detritus of her life after the flood. At some point, it happens to us all. The whispering child of the beck wakes groaning, brimming with rebellion falls on our pavements, saturates our gardens. Soon our homes are swimming in it, six feet and rising in a slime of stench and tainted things. It devours carpets, disorientates objects from their locations, the lives we thought were ours. Always sudden, no matter how slow the drizzle has been, the makeup we administer each day dissolves and everything is live. No choice then but to be still with the dark. If someone flicks a switch, we'll all go up in smoke. Kind people come in wellies, dig out what's left from the silk, drag it into the street, break dirty laundry and sanitary products over once white goods, help you save what they can. It could be worse. Sometimes houses collapse. Land rovers become dinkies, tumble down rivered roads, tarmac ripples, the bridges between us crack. Those of us on low lying ground know the risk, but we'll take our chances. Years will pass before everything is back. Even when all is whitewashed, it will never be as it was. Some things lost forever to the search. She leans on her staff and the crowd process together towards Standage. On the hill, the mummers begins, the green man's advance, Jack Frost's last dance. Men in black spin fire in handheld captain wheels, a firework burst, a crocus, another, another, Rain mixes with paraffin and we cheer on the wind, wait for the sun to catch, the butterfly to take light. I think um, if Ahmed's not here, I think somebody else should, should read now. Yeah, no, I'll, Agma, call me just uh, one second again, uh, one uh, second before. I don't know if you, you I, I think there was a problem with my audio when he called me and okay. sorry about it. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, he said that he's uh, trying to fix his internet connection, but I should continue. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was not ready for this really, but I will continue. Um, I will try to do um, the best as possible. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think I will continue like following the line uh, that Ahmed was um, like what Ahmed was doing was introducing one poem after another and then uh, maybe having a little bit like talked a little bit more with, with each of you, uh, hopefully with Ahmed later on. Um, so um, 
Vera, maybe you should, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Becky, uh, for your reading. Um, it's a very interesting um, subject and, and I think it's, it's very um, important for the context of Great Britain, uh, your last poem, and it's very representative. Um, and I, I, I think we should uh, continue with Vera and then with uh, Laura. Uh, so if you like, Vera, you could uh, maybe um, introduce a little bit yourself and then uh, read a poem after yes. that. Yes, hi. Well, um, so um, I wanted tonight to read um, a poem, poems from my book, which is um, quite lyrical poetry. Um, but actually, um, just as we're sitting here now, oh, hi, Keisha, he's back. <laughs> Welcome back again. I'm really <laughs> sorry. Really That's uh, something quite, quite strange happened. All of a sudden, uh, internet gone, and uh, I wasn't sure where I was actually anyway. So many, many thanks. Hope you had a great time. <laughs> so, so who did, uh, I mean, Becky, uh, did, did, Becky, did you manage to read your second poem? I missed yes. it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, great, fantastic. <laughs> Try to continue, I did my best. <laughs> exactly, many, many thanks. That's very good. <laughs> many thanks. Let us come back to Laura. Hello, Laura. Okay. Uh, <laughs> going, sorry, we, we were, I just introduced Vera and she was going to read. All oh, right, okay, so Vera. But I, I don't mind, we can follow. Okay, I'm Vera, very Vera, happy please to, continue. Yeah. Please continue, yeah. please continue. Okay, so I just wanted to say that I wanted uh, tonight to read lyrical poetry, but actually I felt just now in this moment, um, I don't know if people have heard about the Grenfell Tower fire, uh, and it's uh, my neighborhood, uh, and it's this tragedy that happened, uh, oh, I think people would not have heard from abroad, but uh, there is this block of flats, council flats, uh, mm. in North Kensington in London, and three years ago, there was a fire. Um, it recently um, was renovated and they've done the cladding with a material which was flammable. So when the fire started, it caught very quickly. Uh, it's a very tragic story. Um, and um, uh, people, of course, were in panic and they were calling uh, the ambulances and the fire uh, brigades and um, because uh, London has cut down on the fire stations, um, they just got a call to stay put. Lots of people told, you know, just stay, we're gonna come. Uh, so lots of people, especially on the top floors, um, stayed and they burned live. Um, and, um, you know, we live in this strange time when you can be, you know, filming yourself in the middle of the tragedy. and there was this woman who was um, filming herself from her apartment, um, you know, before her death. Um, and um, yeah, it was just really extraordinary. She was praying mostly. She was a Muslim and she was praying to Allah. So I, I wrote a poem for her uh, to commemorate her and her two daughters that died along with her. Um, so it's for Anya and for her two daughters and for all 72 people who died in the fire. <clears throat> La ilaha illa Allah. We all could see the fire, but we couldn't hear you pray. As carbon was evicting coriander and cumin from the corridors of your stronghold that was weakened to improve the view of those who take more pleasure in the blessings of the gods than gods themselves. La ilaha illa Allah. 11,426 days it took you to find your tower of the modern day Babel, where opulent streets are patrolled by the dispossessed and where the birth of one baby is celebrated so that millions of others can be taxed before they're even born. La ilaha illa Allah. In this city, there are men whose souls were scorched by the African sand and whose souls were lost in the oil wells hidden under the Russian snow, whiter than the bleached teeth. 
and millions of other men in between destitution and obscene profusion. La ilaha illa your almond-shaped nails like to scroll the screen on which this multitude of experience was displayed and on which you shared your little slice of pure and simple joy with those you loved. Two girls paddling in a pool of water, one of them dressed in a blue frock. La ilaha illa Lack of care when cladding, no fire exits, sprinkles uninstalled, no toil is required to raise the death toll, which you were one of the last ones to enlist on that awful night that punched us in the chest years ago. We still stand breathless, as if refusing the air which betrayed your lungs. La ilaha illa we dread to think of the thoughts and feelings that flooded you when you opened the window to look at the flickering stars and lights of the night, a life's freedom you were quickly losing with every lick of the flames below. As your daughters dozed off into their last sleep in the bedroom next door. La ilaha illa la. One of them, Fisia, could have been dreaming of the flower that has been lost from her shoe when she was dancing in her nursery in the morning. She was upset not to find it all at once. Later, the teacher found it and put it on her peg. It was there waiting for her as you repeated the sacred La ilaha illa la. They say the one who dies by the burning is a martyr. We no longer see the fire, yet we hear your prayer. You, Rania, the Mati of London, pray for the ones who stayed behind to carry the burden of pain and guilt. La ilaha illa la. Pray for the ones who told you to stay put. Pray for the ones who neglected, ignored, and didn't care. Pray for the ones who didn't save, didn't help, or just stood by. Pray for all of us that still can see the charcoal on the walls of our city's heart. La ilaha illa la, in the godless city of many gods, there stands a tower clad in unshakable faith and hope that no inferno can devour, invisible to the eyes and built with the sound of your immortalized voice. La ilaha illa Allah, there is no other God except Allah. La ilaha illa Allah. La ilaha illa Allah. Yeah. Very Thank nice. you. Thank you for listening. Very beautiful. I mean, let us not say anything after this wonderful reading of a wonderful poem. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, perhaps those who are watching now, Vera uh, joined at least two sessions before, so you are familiar with Vera's poetry and Vera's thoughts uh, about poetry. So Vera is also a, an Ukrainian British uh, actor, uh, and perhaps she makes film as well. So I'll, I'll ask, uh, she has played Elena in Channel 4's cult series, Peep Show, alongside David Mitchell and Robert Webb. Eva is lesbian vampire killers with James, with James Corden and Matthew Horn, and Svetlana in a five-part BBC One drama, The Deep Opposite, Mini, drive, mini driver, James Nesbet and Goran. Uh, Vera, did you uh, uh, try to, or did you already make some short films by any chance? Because uh, uh, I um, had an impression that you, thank you apart, so from much. Acting, yes. apart from acting, you, yeah. you had a huge interest in. Yeah, I've began directing in uh, 2013. I did a little short. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had a series of difficult life events, which um, mm -hmm. prevented me from um, being able to engage in such um, 
a hard uh, job as filmmaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. I resumed uh, last year and I uh, did some poetry films. So mm. I went in back into filmmaking through poetry. And as mm. I was uh, doing the poetry films with my poems, um, my love for the filmmaking, you know, fictional filmmaking came back. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I just filmed uh, a, a dark comedy again. Mm -hmm. I do love comedy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're actually submitting one to the festival today. So that's Great. exciting. Great. Yes. So um, did you... I, sorry, I really enjoyed like the music of the poem. When you were saying like, la, 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 la like that part of the, I really love that. Sounds yeah, amazing. This is, this is, I'm familiar with la, 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 la. This is something that Muslims always find. Yes, of course, uh, yes. As a, as How a, do you pronounce it? Sorry, I probably mis mispronounced no, you did, it. You didn't did, did, know, you didn't did right way, you didn't did right way. Many, many thanks. I bet I will come back to you again, but let's, uh, let us go back to uh, Laura. So let us move on to Laura's performance, Laura Potts. And Laura performed, Laura joined before. Laura is a wonderful, extremely talented poet. Laura was born in Wakefield, um, so Yorkshire, a poet of Yorkshire, uh, and grew up in the village of Harbury. She's the only child of, of George Ports and a sheep's joiner and Jane, Jane Finch. Her mother, a pianist, owned a place at Lee's College of Music, whilst her father was a bagpiper with Newcastle City Pipe Band. So, uh, Laura is an award-winning poet, as you know. Uh, many poems have been published. Many poems of her have been published uh, in uh, prestigious anthologies. Uh, let us listen to her poetry and then we'll perhaps talk, we'll start talking. Let us start a session, start a round of performance first and then we'll go back to uh, each one and talk and explore about their poetic journey. Laura, let's have uh, your performance now. You're on mute, sorry, yeah. Alma Mater, widow black and winter, evening took me south into lamps turning blue in the dusk, out and over my hometown's musk lay the hinterland hills breathing low in the dark, still frost spark sharp on the city street. Holy rain sweet in the winter and the wet, with no evening stars ahead, I let the pavement take me home. Through the town nocturnal, gloam and grey, my chimney throat coughing its smoke, I saw a slope on the city's slow spine, those old black gates, the summer of my days inside. Grief cracked my face. Those navy girls and me, a pace always ahead. But in the pale stairwell light, the ghost of my girlhood, dead in its fresh green spring and gone. From roadside wet, I looked on at this child of light, her afterglow bright, her ashes of life already black, the cold breath of loss on my face. At my back, a school bell cracked at the evening air. I saw death at my table there, tipping his hat, and the years in my face that sank as I sat at that desk at the back of the class. I remember that. And last, on an old December evening, 
Down the hallways dark, the wilting hymns of girls turn ghosts before their time. I saw their eyes like candles cold, like lights no longer leading home. Outside, to the bone I shook and swung, the darkened seas that were my eyes, done and gone at the sight of myself and each girl ringing her own passing bell. Well, in that mist and half-dark morning, my face a clenching fist in pavement pools, I saw that septic terminal school for what it was. I never went back, of course. I tipped my compass north. Thank you. Many, many, many thanks, Laura. Many thanks. Is it possible to read another one? Yes, of course. Thank you. Sweet autumn. And years later, you at the bus stop. Yesterday's leaves in your hair. The seat where we laugh. Our words in the air. Sweetheart, the years threaded up our names scratched on the glass. Rain argued away the grass-stained fingerprints. The love turned over on clumsy tongues. The moon bows, the flimsy suns. My skin soft-tossed in sheets hard kissed, the taste of your words, the clench of my fist in the deafening dawn, O oh day, when the pavement rolled beneath our feet, bubblegum from the shop, my money mouth, your Friday chips, stop, darling how we used to crease at the waist, Pink and white laughter poured from our lips. And when I meet you at the curb of my sleep, it is when we were here, my heart in your hands, your hands on my dress. They say you spilt your filth down telephone wires for cheap love and sex. I wouldn't know. I walked away. Like this, yes. Wow, many, many thanks, Laura. Your poetry is bliss to hear as well, poetry reading, along with the power uh, of the tapestry that you weave. Uh, so musical, as if some drop of dews are falling so silently. A reading is very uh, soothing along with the powerful harmony of words uh, you whipped so far. Uh, let us uh, come back to, uh, let us move on to some audience's feedback. Uh, we can see Tapu Shrai, who's, a, uh, who's, a, who's an admirer of uh, music, wrote incredible collaboration of talents to spread the poetry of hearts, Bonani Chakraborty, a prominent poet of, uh, from Bengali language, uh, joined actually from India, Kolkata. So she wrote, uh, it's wonderful uh, on Laura's reading. Jawahir Hussain, congratulations on the beautiful Sri Ganguly, a, a powerful writer, powerful fiction writer who will be featured as part of the series uh, on 22nd, 22nd Monday. Uh, she wrote lovely, Bonani Chakraborty, beautiful. So please leave your comments there, comments in, uh, and if you have any request or if you'd like to be, uh, if you'd like to generate any, any uh, discussion, please feel free to uh, leave, leave this as comment. Uh, many, many thanks who have already joined. Let, uh, let's, uh, let us move on to Becky now. Becky, 
you are a wonderful poet, but also you have <clears throat> you are quite academically uh, uh, s studying or perhaps teaching uh, poetry, creative writing. Could you please tell us why uh, poetry is important to you and for others? Okay, so I I started writing poetry when I was a teenager, as a lot mm -hmm. of people do. Um, and for me, it was I was I was going through some tough times, and poetry was a way of of expressing myself. It was a way of trying to understand the world and and to somehow fit it into that the the form of a poem. Um, it wasn't what would be considered very good poetry, but it, it was it was very useful for me. And um, I also was I also was incredibly shy. So writing poetry gave me that voice that I couldn't well couldn't mm -hmm. have so well out loud. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's remained it's remained important. So I at a level I I took English at A-level and I came across Dylan Thomas mm. um, and so it was quite a spiritual experience for me reading Dylan Thomas because I felt that not only did I love his lyricism or the natural imagery and um, the idea of, of God being in, in all sorts of in all areas of nature really um, he he found a way of expressing something that I'd was, which was this connection with, with nature um, and its poetry's remained that for me um, the last 17 years I've been teaching creative writing workshops in with different communities so well. a, a lot of the time it's not um, sometimes it's educational but often it's more um, about well-being and and mental health or even physical health perhaps poetry that involves um going out and um, exploring the, the, the world through poetry. And for the people that I work with, it can be the highlight of their life, coming to their week, coming to a, a poetry session. So it can perform that same function of, of allowing them to express difficulties mm. in their own life, but also to communicate um, how they feel about things and work out how they feel about things and also then then there are people who really who really take on poetry and become mm -hmm. poets um, and I think performing as well so it's so a lot of um, the the writers I've worked with perform their poetry so that again can give people some people who maybe aren't as strong on the page mm -hmm. but they can they can perform wonderfully Hmm. So uh, this is something, uh, I'm not sure, just let me be honest. Uh, whenever I, in library, I know that there are so many sessions of poetry we, we host uh, under different title, Poetry for Wellbeing. And for some reasons, uh, I find it quite shallow because uh, that when a poet writes poetry, when I personally write poetry, it doesn't connect with anyone's well-being. This is perhaps, I'm just writing my schizophrenic journey. That might not be, that most definitely not be uh, uh, the reflection of anyone else's. Uh, it is just my personal note, almost like my diary. And then the imagery is that comes to me. Uh, it comes to me as almost like an oracle regardless of whether someone is liking it or not, it is uh, almost like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fated to write this. And, and like you said, quite rightly say, you said that this is the only way I can express myself. This is the only, and whether it is helping uh, others, and I'm, I'm sure no poet actually writes because it is benefiting or helping people. Uh, but did you feel ever like this? I mean, whenever, whenever you, because obviously you are a leader or team leader or uh, what's that called? Uh, uh, worship leader. 
And when you use those terminology, poetry for well-being, is it a way to shrink the vastness of poetry? No, uh, I, don't, of just I don't actually usually use that terminology to describe mm -hmm. the workshops. That's just what happens. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not so much that the people who are attending those workshops often are coming, um, they might not be, they might not intend to come for their well-being, but they find mm. um, that, because oh, I've got a question for you, how do you feel after you've written a poem? Well, yeah, for myself it is a redemption, but for others perhaps, and also, I mean, when we try to relate this with well-being, I, I find whether, I mean, this is perhaps for others uh, to focus on the beauty of an artistry, beauty of uh, someone's uh, someone's dexterity of creating harmony with many words that might not be, that might not have any meaning even afterwards, uh, or many, uh, I mean, what's that called? Combination of words. It may have some profound meaning, uh, or, or uh, it might not have any, what's that called? Any, uh, any mundane meaning. Uh, sometimes it comes almost like an oracle to you the words might not have any uh, resemblance with each other. Uh, and then there are many poets. When I listen, when I read sort of my favorite poet, for example, Kabati or Josephers, uh, uh, I find the same thing actually. Uh, they, when they're talking about an, a great poet of uh, Jivarananda, let me quote from Jivarananda, while he was addressing some old river and then he goes to sunshine. So river doesn't have any any uh, connection with even sunshine. It comes uh, completely different. Uh, it comes from completely different thread. So uh, I mean, the usual way of meaning where meaning uh, you know look for the meaning of poetry and also imposing the benefit, uh, seeking the benefit whether it is benefiting society or not. Is it, I mean, are you talking? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm talking about the benefit for the, for the participants of being there. Oh, right, the participants, the right, yeah. Writing. Okay. But there's also, there is also something that happens in the social process of being involved yeah. in a workshop and, and that exchange of, of hearing others work, learning from what works and, and learning from what, what doesn't work so well. And those different voices and, and poets having, beginning to, understand what their voice might be or voices because I believe that poets can have voices um, and, and and responding to one another and sometimes a, a poet will read um, something that they've written there and then a first draft mm -hmm. and it will, it will create that that emotional response from somebody else in the workshop that um, relatability we they, they mm. call it in the GCSE now um, mm. That, that somebody in that room will feel as though they've articulated, this poet has articulated their experiences. So then it becomes this, this wonderful social experience and it builds confidence. Mm. It really can build people's confidence. Um, as, these, are, these are early writers, writers mm. in the early stages. Um, I would like to add that uh, in Argentina, um, there was an issue with this, that uh, so many women were uh, writing for well-being and they were like um, reporting abuse and a lot of issues uh, in their writing that it, become, it, it became a sort of issue in a way because most women were uh, talking about that like in, uh, instead of focusing in like, I don't know, maybe doing, talking about other issues or maybe, um, you know, like using their creativity, cre um, creative minds uh, to talk to other issues, but um, they were so full of things they wanted to say regarding uh, these uh, problems that they face day to day in, in their, uh, you know, uh, daily life. Uh, that is a, the, now there are, there are a new, it's a new thing, you know, like everyone is talking about that, like how many uh, women are, how many women are using writing for reporting things or for uh, talking about their well-being, uh, talking about their uh, minds, talking about their how they feel, and 
I don't know if this is familiar to you, Becky, but I just wanted to add this. Uh, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I wonder if, if what will happen is when, when they've said enough about those issues, they will then go on to write other things and connect more with the world in, in other ways. Um, I suppose it depends if they still feel that they're in traumatic situations or not. Um, and yeah, I think they, they were still in the, in a, you know, in this traumatic situation and they were not able to like move on from there. Like they were using writing just to report, but not maybe to, you know, I, I don't know if this makes sense, but yeah, they were in that, in that phase, yeah. Yeah, so, but hopefully maybe with some of them, they will be able to develop the confidence to, to leave those situations, but I know that is not easy and, and I don't know, I can't speak to the, the culture mm -hmm. there either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Gabby. Uh, I'll come back to you again, Becky. Uh, is it? I mean, let us have another poem from Becky. Okay. This is this is. For well, this is something that I I personally, when people ask me, uh, what is the theme you you lo love to write, and then I find it quite a shallow question, uh, mm. because because I mean the. Words are poetry to me, like Malarme said. The words come to me and then I just construct. There is no any theme. I never look for the theme. And then uh, when someone re read, or sorry, write feminist poetry or imagist poetry, I find it quite uh, hard to accept. How come a poet, uh, it should be, I mean, if you intentionally deliver some words uh, to portray some, you know, constructed meaning, then it became almost like a formula poetry. And then I poetry to me uh, is always oracle, always something that uh, that defines, that, that goes beyond the uh, mundane meaning or mundane theme. Anyway, let's have another point. Well, from I that. would say a feminist poem done well is not mundane at all. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to read. I'm going to read a poem that has a lot of different meanings. Um, mm -hmm. I think that readers can. For me, the best poems have lots of different meanings. They're mm -hmm. Thank this, you. This is the flayed fish. It's a prose poem. On a glass-fronted bookshelf in my great uncle's porch, there lived a thirty-five-pound carp in a frame. I say lived, but of course, it was dead. Angled from a lake and silenced like someone whose heart is in trouble and is put in a coma to give them a chance. Because the glass was mildewed and opaque, the fish looked to be encased in ice. It had been caught in a body of water belonging to the family home. My uncle was always carping on about the family home, which is now an ailing leisure club. The lake served as a fridge in the days before fridges and the children would skate on it in the winter. The first time he told me the tale, I saw that underwater world of the past through his clear lens. Its iridescent shock plucked out, still twitching in an attempt to escape its skin. Each time he told it, something deteriorated, imperceptible at first. Its fin split and tinged in sepia as the air was getting in and colour seeping out. And every time he lost the thread or I couldn't quite catch it, he'd say, Not much point carping on. I can't recall the details now, the cast of the weather, or what his father said. But I still know where it came from and at night feel its cold, still weight in my chest. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, your poetry reflects the uh, philosophy you have, actually, and that you mentioned. And uh, to me, I mean, poetry, well, let us talk and define. I'll, I have so many things to share, actually. Let us come back to Vera now. And then, Becky, just to let you know, in Facebook, you actually shared one of my previous live instead of this one. So uh, 
is it possible uh, if you go to my Facebook, not the, uh, what's that called? I've started a watch party, not this one, but you'll find another one and you'll see yourself there. Uh, you can share the other one. I just tagged you as well, so you can share from there. Anyway, so let us come back to uh, Gerald. Hello, Gerald. Uh, you are in it. Yes. <laughs> uh, could you tell us again the same question that I asked Becky? Why poetry is important to you? Um, perhaps, perhaps for readers as well. Perhaps you read it. Um, well, um, my well to start with, my my mom is. Um, is a teacher of uh, Spanish literature. So I think I grew up um, among books and uh, yes, readings and going to the poetry uh, festivals with my mother since I was very, very, uh, since I was four years old, I think so. So um, yeah, I just, I think it becomes very natural. And then I started writing and going to um, just different events since I was eight years old, um, very young, really. And um, I think it's essential, it's vital for me because it's the way to, um, to untangle the world, mm. reading and untangle the world. Um, mm. So, I can't conceive myself um, without poetry or music. For me, they are mm -hmm. not the same thing, but you know, they are related. And um, yes. Okay, let us let us uh, have uh, more reading from Gerald. Okay. Um, I will read. Will you read for yourself, Gerald? Whose poetry uh, intrigues you uh, from Argentina's, from Argentine poetry? Whose poetry you love to read when you read for yourself, not for a situation where you perhaps push to read, um, but only when you like to like to read for yourself. Yes, not not from Argentina only. I like very, I, I like a lot to read uh, Latin American um, yeah. writers. So I, I, I like some, some uh, for some reasons your sound is uh, breaking. Yes, is to see why why this is happening. Uh, is that better? Uh, is it better if you just talk a bit more? We'll see. Uh, can you oh. talk? Right, okay, let's, let's go on, yes. So- uh, It's breaking a perhaps, lot. Yeah, so tell us perhaps uh, uh, some more names from Argentine poetry. Oh, sorry, Latin American poetry. Uh, that <laughs> the poets that you, that you love to read. Uh, I, I like a lot. Um, well, I'm, I'm reading now um, Arnaldo Caldeira. Um, Al Arnaldo? Albania, right, okay. Yeah, so I think, oh, it's, sorry, it's the other way. <laughs> anyway, um, I like him a lot. Um, he he writes uh, poetry and prose as well, poetry mm. prose, uh, which um, I like a lot. And I love uh, Marosa Di Giorgio. She's, mm. um, well, um, she's uh, uh, from Uruguay. Um, Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uruguay, yes. I, mm. I really like uh, because she writes like um it's surrealism and um, yes and she talks mm. about uh, nature and, and fairies and all these kind of things I, I love really. And then I love I like from Argentina uh, Olga Orozco. Um, she, she's one of my uh, favorites. So if you have the opportunity to read mm. them, I yeah, uh, I think you should. Mm. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't read anything by the Uruguayan poet that you mentioned. Perhaps I'm not sure whether 
there is some English translations. If it is not, uh, Gerald, you have to translate perhaps next task on you now to translate uh, these wonderful poets if they are not already translated in English. The Uruguayan poet you mentioned is quite uh, not familiar. Cheryl um, does a great job like uh, interviewing writers uh, and because um, we collaborate together in La Ninfa Echo, which is this magazine for writers uh, mm -hmm. from all over the world. And mm -hmm. he does a really great job at, and, and she knows so many writers from Latin America. Oh, great. Yeah. So Gerald, please read some, uh, read uh, if you kind of read some poems. Okay. Uh, we read some. Is that in somebody. Spanish? Is that in Spanish? Yeah. I'm trying to see why this uh, sound is breaking. Uh, Sorry. No, when um, you read when you read when you read first the first time when you started, it was pretty good, but now it looks like that there is a, there are some uh, breaking sound and noise uh, light. Okay, if if it doesn't get sold. We have to continue with this. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you like me to move just in one minute? Go to another part of the house. I mean, if you if you kindly see this, yeah. If you kindly, yeah. Or, okay. or best way, best way, Gerald. If you come out of the, if you leave the session and then if you come back, following the same link. Okay, I will do that. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah that may. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, I'm going back to I'm going back to Vera. Uh, hello, Vera. Hello again. Hello again. So you love Indian mysticism, Indian yes. metaphysical poetry. You love Tagore, the first Nobel laureate uh, from the East in literature, and for his phenomenal work. For his phenomenal work. Uh, prefaced by W.B. Yeats, uh, Gitanjali, the songs of offerings. Uh, and then I see this, the enigma, the mystic, uh, the mystic uh, nature of uh, Indian metaphysical poetry uh, in, in your tone. Uh, and the way you write poetry um, um, to me is more Indian. And then you found so many myths, so many myths, like sort of you, this is, uh, I mean, la 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 and And some of the poems that I read recently, uh, that that is quite, I mean, uh, any Indian reader can perhaps relate you uh, uh, more. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what the, what, what's the first book that you, what's the, what's the book that uh, recently published? What's the name of the book? It's called The Holy Longing. Holy, Holy Longing. The Holy Longing, and it was called after Goethe's poem by the same name. Mm -hmm. And Goethe's poem is about, uh, was based on, well, supposedly based on Hafiz's poem. <laughs> about the butterfly that flies mm -hmm. into an open flame mm -hmm. and uh, gets burnt in the flame. Yeah, so uh, because, it was, because you teach uh, yoga, so is poetry yes. almost meditative to you? Is a way of meditation? Well, because I think the, it, it depends because um, it's funny you said that because the poem I was about to read, I don't think it's that mystical. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a way of, it's definitely a way to reach for deeper places within myself, mm -hmm. but it's also a way to express pain. Mm -hmm. So such as with the previous poem I've read, mm -hmm. um, or express anything really. I mean, why just pain? Uh, hope. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I think it's very, I think it's similar in some ways to how I, I practice yoga because I try to approach each class I teach or each uh, of my own practice with kind of a realization of a bigger path of where I'm going and trying to bring 
yearning. So this longing mm. that I talk about in my poems, I think mm. it's there in my practice because you're mm. yearning to grow when mm. you do yoga. It's all about finding that union between your mind, body and soul. Mm. And to mm. really, I think for it to be really effective, you have to have the strong yearning to find mm. your soul. And you can find mm. it through poetry. Writing mm. poetry is the journey home. It's, uh, yeah. as other poets have mentioned, that's the way mm. to express your inner truth. Mm. So it is really interrelated, yes. Mm. No, just, to, just also to clarify, the Indian idea of mysticism, the Indian paradigm of uh, uh, mysticism is very vast, actually. So yeah, you may find the devotion, meditation, everything is packed wrapped in the world. Many, many other things yeah. uh, are part of Indian way of describing mysticism. Uh, but uh, we, um, I mean, before we uh, come back to uh, your reading again, could you also tell us a bit more, uh, if you can, I'm not sure that you have that idea, um, uh, whether you read Ukrainian poetry, uh, or you know, you uh, if you kindly tell us a bit more on Ukrainian poetry, if you... I wish I could. I've left yeah. home when I was 13. Yeah. And I did my GCSEs and A-levels in the UK. So I haven't mm. been home since I was 13. So, yeah. you know, when I was growing up, I was reading Silver Plath. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm much more attuned to, I think, Brit... You know, I sound Indian, because I think mm. that's what I'm missing, maybe, in England. Mm. Um, and I need to find that in my poetry, but I don't actually even know to my shame. I'm so in, sorry. Any, right. okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't follow it so closely. Um, I know I've come across one Russian poet who I've really mm. enjoyed recently. Who, who is, who is... Uh, her name is Vera Palaskova. Vera? Palaskova. Palaskova, right. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I did enjoy her poetry, very Russian and passionate. Um, mm. um, mm. But uh, yes, I, I, I would like to explore more. So maybe other people know more than me, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, from the poetry that I really love, um, I, you know, I read uh, contemporary magazines, but I think by my bedside, I have um, quite a few American poets. I, I love Mary Oliver. Hmm. Um, then, um, Oh goodness, this is so funny when you forget the name of your favorite poet. The, it's a very similar poet, Wendy. Um, I'm so sorry, I forgot. That's mm. not good when you start. Mm. <laughs> um, let me just write the you name know, these days you can just check. So you are very, very diverse interest as well. I mean, you try to, uh, you made films and then I'm sure you tried perhaps to uh, depict uh, a poetry in celluloid. Uh, so well, look I, forward to look forward to watching your uh, film that you already made. I would love to share with you. Yes, poetry mm -hmm. films. Yes, uh, obviously comedy is totally different, and mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. kind of about loss of spirituality. Really, you know, mm -hmm. laughing at our mistakes when you lost the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone would like to ask anything to Vera? So Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry, I'm so sorry that he's oh, another Wendell. one I love, yeah. But this is the kind of poetry that I think I need for my soul. Um, so mm. I'd keep that on my bedside while, you know, I love reading contemporary magazines and can be really impressed by mm. contemporary poetry. But I think to really feed yourself, I think mm -hmm. poets like that. Oh, could I recommend another poet? If people mm -hmm. have never read Arseniy Tarkovsky, not Tarkovsky, the filmmaker. So what's the... It's the father. It's the father of the filmmaker. He was an amazing, amazing Russian poet. poet. Well. Yes. Ah, and... so that's why. That, that is the link. So why... Yes. Whenever you, whenever you watch Tarkovsky, you see a piece of poetry. Exactly. Almost like, like I told you again, told you last time that I found, I mean, I found, I, I feel sort of I'm a spiritual disciple of two wonderful poets of film. One is Tarkovsky, one is Bergman, Ingmar Bergman. Yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, this is why perhaps you see Tarkovsky's uh, matter, Tarkovsky's object is so focused. Exactly. And so poetically done. 
So it came from his father. From his father. And in fact, there is this really interesting academic book that examines the link between Arseniy Tarkovsky poetry and Andrei Tarkovsky films and mm. shows how many images that we have mm. uh, seen on Tar in Tarkovsky's movie are actually coming from the poems. So they're, mm. they're poetic images which he have taken from his father's um, mm. poetry. And likewise, Boris Pasternak is another Russian okay. poet I okay. love. And his mm. father was a painter. And mm. likewise, in Dr. Zhivago, when you read the mm. novel, there sure. are so many scenes which were mm. depicted on the paintings of his father. So mm. he just described them and they became scenes in his novel. So what about Yusef Brodsky? Yusef Brodsky? Yes. Yusef Brodsky? Yeah, I like him, but he's never, you know, I get never, very yeah. obsessed with one or two poets and then I read them all mm. the time. And Brodsky is someone who I recognize he's excellent. But mm. he doesn't capture me as much. But but Pasternak, mm. uh, who by the way, Thomas Merton, as you know, the yes. Christian mystic, mm. American Christian mm -hmm. mystic, mm. he corresponded with Pasternak at the height of Cold War, and you can imagine mm. how difficult that was. Mm. And he always used to say that he's the most spiritual poet of that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Thomas Merton saying it. And remember, you while you're talking, I was. Uh, now I'm re I read him uh, about 15 years ago, but I didn't find it find him that interesting. You know why? But, because uh, it's but, very difficult to translate into English. He was a uh, composer, and his uh, language and the music of the language is a very essential part. It's not mm. just about the meaning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need right. to find a good translation. Mm -hmm. Oh, perhaps that's why. And then I'm not sure another poet. Uh, uh, Georg Trakl, um, the one who committed suicide as well, perhaps everyone knows. And then I read him about 15 years ago. Uh, I I wasn't that attracted, but when I read him now, mm -hmm. uh, especially I find meaninglessness in everything. And then I relate Georg Trakl uh, more than anyone else perhaps now. So many thanks, Bera. Yeah, anyone would like to ask anything to Bera? Uh, Gaby, Becky, Laura, okay, let's... Uh... Um. <laughs> Gaby, are you asking anything? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask if you have any uh, projects for the future. Thank you. I, I would like to compile the poems I've been reading in the last couple of years into the book. Okay. Um, and I'm working on other film projects, but it's very difficult now for everyone, oh, yeah. of oh. course, to make any plans. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, maybe you can change the format. <laughs> I know. We considered, we worked for a few weeks on doing a play on Zoom, hmm. actually wow. based, based on the uh, letter correspondences between Pasternak Rilke and Tvetaeva. Yeah. I've uh, um, adapted the letters into the play a few years ago. And unfortunately, I think I don't really find um, the Zoom picture beautiful enough. Oh, yeah. You know, well, I but, think... Yeah, because like, I think uh, today I was talking about how uh, Zoom, like, or this new, like, thing that we are all living, <laughs> um, this change that we all experience in the world, that uh, I was thinking that Zoom also allow us to have other possibilities like now we are people from like we can have people from everywhere in the same place and that's yeah. new because that, that's you know, true. Usually, yeah so maybe you know like we have yeah, new maybe something else like a different project i felt for that sort of thing you you know want more photography and it's very difficult to achieve in our homes look i mean we can even barely yes. see some of yeah, us yeah, yeah. No, that's true okay Bernard. Let's start. Let's have uh, you read. Let's yes. uh, listen to Vera's reading now. So I wanted to read a poem, um, which is a response to Charles Baudelaire's um, hmm. poem to a passerby. I don't know if anyone wow. is familiar. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah, you know that one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it is quite a Sufi poem in a way. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it's very romantic. 
and uh, there are, there are, just... there are, let me just add something where there are very few poets that I can read after midnight and Baudelaire is one of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I can read the poem quickly. So mm -hmm. there please, is a context. Please, Thank you. To a passerby. The street about me roared with a deafening sound. Tall, slender, in heavy mourning, majestic grief, a woman passed with a glittering hand, raising, swinging the hem and flounces of her skirt. Agile and graceful, her legs was like a statue's. Tense as in a delirium, I drank from her eyes, pale sky where tempests germinate the sweetness that enthralls and the pleasure that kills. A lightning flash, then night. Fleeting beauty, by whose glance I was suddenly reborn. Will I see you no more before eternity? Elsewhere, far, far from here, too late, never perhaps. For I know not where you fled, you know not where I go, or you whom I would have loved, or you who knew it. So that's the Charles Baudelaire's poem. <laughs> it's not mine, <laughs> no, no, it's no. Charles Baudelaire. Um, and um, yes, and I just wanted to uh, write a female response to it. And it's not kind of mm. angry feminist, but it's quite different. Um, it was just one moment of summer when walking down a cobbled street, I felt that I was someone else, someone who hasn't lost home, who still feels the sweetness of the soul unsplit, someone who deals with time without cutting it into manageable chunks, without keeping memories in tins dated incorrectly on purpose so no one knows where I was and when, even myself. That would be some luck. Someone who feels confident and complete without anyone's applause, who smiles at herself in the mirror, who doesn't care about success and achievements, who can be joyful during peace and wars. Someone who always stands up for the truth in her heart without reservation and fears, for whom love has never become a supporting act on the lineup, who appreciates the value of friendship, who serves and gives rather than uses and takes, someone whose lips are for kissing, not for cursing, whose body is for dancing and lovemaking, not only for work and sex who continues to write love poetry beyond her teenage years, whose eyes never lost their light and heart is so full of tenderness, it spills over at everyone who passes by without any restraints. It was just one moment of summer when I felt that I was someone else and you were passing by and perceived everything that I could be and fell in love madly. And in that one single moment of passing, lived with me deliriously happy until your dying breath. Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful, exactly, exactly. So, you said. Yes, I think, you know, Charles right. was just looking at the exterior <laughs> of the woman <laughs> and the woman always wants much more than just that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Vera. Let's uh, come back to Gerald. So, Gerald. Hi. Uh, yeah, sound is far better now. Far is it better. better? Yeah, it is yeah. better. It Great. is better. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, um, I will read them. Um, I will read one of my poems in Spanish from my last book. Um, right, good. Okay, 
Garmon o esta vieja música de nieve. Garmon. Black Moon de Wilco. Una. Aquí el sol no acontece. Un arco iris tiembla desde la tierra. Por la mañana, la bruma visita a los corderos. Se acuesta entre robles y con sonrisa de otro mundo, jura detenerse. 2. Él sale a cazar mi orfandad a las colinas azules. Orbitante se estremece. Me pregunta si los dioses existen y abovedo preguntas más vastas que la noche. 3. Es el río, con su lenguaje espiral de reino antiguo. A veces recuerdo algunas cosas, pero sopla el viento, se desgajan las piedras y Dios galopa muerto. Great. Uh, Gaby, could you, could you give us exactly? Yeah, um, it's a shame that this is like the language barrier, because mm. I, I believe this poem will be like, I, I actually think you, Ahmed, you would love this poem, mm -hmm. um, because it's about like Cheryl is, has a um, really amazing ability um, to use nature and mm. a lot of uh, these uh, scenic uh, imaginary um, worlds uh, to talk mm. about other things. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, and it's really amazing what she does uh, with mm. talking about, like she has a lot of metaphors about nature. And um, so these are like um, a series of, like these are like, I don't know how to call it, uh, Cheryl, like, uh, for mm. um, different, I don't four. know how to say that, yeah. Yeah, like, like four fragments in the same poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and each of them describe different, um, like, yeah, describe, use, yeah, these images from nature to describe other mm. things. So it, and, and it's also a bit mystical, and that's why I think, uh, Ahmed, that you would love it. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. uh, it's about God and it's about, um, you know, it's existential and it's about mm. nature. And, and that, that's why I believe it will be a poem that you will enjoy. Um, thank you, thank you. So that's, uh, Gerald, uh, the poems that you mentioned before, we need to read them. Uh, the, uh, definitely all those powerful poems, uh, uh, translation doesn't, doesn't reflect the actual power and artistry. But at least, uh, at least we can we can be familiar with uh, sixty percent or fifty percent of of the artwork. Uh, I will uh, I will you. try to translate them and then I can yeah I can share it with you and all of you if you want. Thank uh, you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this is I'm personally uh, an agnostic man, but still yeah. the the the. Uh, the, when I read mystic poetry, when I read metaphysical poetry, although from a realistic point of view, uh, I see differently. But for reading, it 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 how I mean, it uh, uh, intrigues me, uh, especially when it uh, I mean I because I work with music, especially classical music, Indian classical music, mm -hmm. and then I try to offer. Uh, kind of an interpretation of a spiritual meaning of the music through poetry. And then this poetry helps a lot to offer at least a kind of uh, communication for people who are non-technical audiences. Mm -hmm. So many thanks, Gerald. Uh, yeah. Let's come back to Laura. Laura, a, 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 an audience, Taposhrai said, would love to know why poetry, I'm just placing this question to you, uh, if you kindly perhaps uh, answer from your point of view, 
Wang poetry is a powerful mean of expression. Uh, so while you are talking about perhaps why uh, poetry, what poetry means to you, uh, uh, if you kindly uh, relate this question as well, how poetry can influence masses and whether poetry can influence masses, this is another, another question. So when you answer, if you kindly relate uh, this um, question from audience. Um, I think, well, when I think about why I started writing poetry, it was a little bit like what Becky said. I was quite a naturally shy child and it was a way of holding a mirror up to myself and seeing myself reflected back. It was a very, very quiet, powerful means of expression. And I think I only write poetry, I don't write prose. And that's because there's something always new and novel about language with poetry. Um, it's about it's about searching for new ways to express yourself, um, new ways to translate your hurt or your happiness. And I think it, it lends itself very well to, to, as you said, um, reaching out to the masses. Mm -hmm. um, it, because it does, it does use language in that quite incongruent, new way um, that can encapsulate feelings that you have too many words in everyday life to describe them. Whereas one line of poetry or one poem can sum up so many emotions. Does mm. that make sense? Does anyone else mm. understand mm. that? I'm sure, probably yeah. explaining it in a very- No, 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 it's way. well explained. Well explained, Laura, well explained. Uh, Another poem from you, if that's okay, Laura. I used to work at the Dylan Thomas birthplace in Swansea. Mm -hmm. and everyone, well, most people that went thought that it was Bob Dylan's house. <laughs> and I, I wrote this while I was there. This is Swansea Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were supposed to uh, do a session in Dylan Thomas Center. This uh, this July, but for COVID, it has to be it has to be cancelled. So that is a, a classical music event and um, interpreting some mood of a uh, mood and and the thread of classical music through Dylan Thomas's poem. Anyway, please carry on. Swansea, son. He is here in my autumn of age. The river light through window panes. The small hour laughter, the slim supple night, and moonlight eyes on the history page. I, remem I remember his name could shake out the stars when the stage of the world lit its lights for him. And I, Summer's daughter, he, Swansea's son, whose words in the plash of the water we hear in the echoes of hills. Still, the ghost of my arms in the cracked black night. Still, in stairwells, the old grey light that writes of deer shaping the dales, that writes of bonfire bright, half ale, that writes of death in his coat and tails. You, man of words with the firefly eyes, who didn't stay to see the wild spring flowers riot on the mountainside, who died like a steeple that cradles its bones, and whose voice now sleeps beneath Wales's stones. You, my lone man with the light, whether I'm there with you or not, well, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Many, many thanks. Becky, um, 
what is the, perhaps, let us start with a question to you. Uh, what is the future of poetry with growing uh, expansion of technology uh, where uh, wave expressions are uh, perhaps expanding in one way, shrinking in another way? So what's your own, own idea about the future of poetry? Uh, yeah, I suppose I suppose with the more technology, there's there's more there are more different ways of interpreting, and there are more um, there are more ways of combining poetry with other art forms, aren't they? So with film or with um, with the ear. So um, and poetry obviously was was originally spoken mm. form. Uh, I think there is something very special about the relationship between a reader and the poem mm. uh, that is a very intimate experience that perhaps a lot of technological encounters with poetry don't allow that in quite the same way mm. and, and perhaps don't don't you don't have as much time to digest the poem or to go back over a poem I like to I do like to read poems on the page I, I like to listen to poetry as well for me it's very much an oral uh, form mm. Um, mm. so I do like to look like to hear it but mm. I also like to go back to it and read in my own time um, and linger mm. over certain bits and Vani Capilgio um, is, is doing a series at the moment of uh, it's a commission for of the University of York um, mm -hmm. Lots of it's around silences and pauses, um, mm -hmm. and she there, there, there are she reads, but you can also read the poem yourself. So there are two different ways she's using technology. It's ba quite basic technology, but there mm -hmm. are different ways of reading the poem, um, mm -hmm. and she's encouraging those stops, which I think is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes I'm not sure whether you feel in the same way. When I read some, some great uh, poet that I love, uh, one is a great uh, poet of Bengal called Jivarananda Dash, uh, and his phenomenal poem called Bonalata Shen, and where he, he was uh, analogizing uh, uh, dusk, with the sound of dew. So where, uh, and from realistic point of view, whether there is a sound of dew, whether the sound of dew exists and whether there is any real analogy. I mean, so people from people in this era, they, they like to explore some sort of uh, tangible meaning. So would you think after 10 or 20 years, people will still look for uh, these uh, powerful metaphors, the powerful way of exploring uh, the sound and exploring the world like you were under that did. I hope so. I hope we'll have, I hope poetry will become less um, one thing. I think this, this passion for poetry of, of it being very, um, very realistic um, mm -hmm. That has value, but I, it's not the only form of poetry. And for me, poetry is much more interesting if it has different layers and different meanings. And technology mm -hmm. could potentially add to that, but I wouldn't want the reader to lose that experience of imagining that sound of dew, mm -hmm. and really feeling what that's like. And that might not work for everybody. They might not mm -hmm. Um, have any kind of synesthetic sense of, of what that is, but for other people that might be very meaningful. Mm -hmm. So let us have another poem, Becky, if that's okay. Okay. Um, I'm aware I've, I've read um, more than everybody else so far. Yeah, so uh, perhaps I'll ask everyone to read. Uh, after you uh, finish your reading, I will ask everyone to read and not talk just read one more poem. Okay. Um, so this is, um, you, you will recognize this quotation. It's um, Mahatma Gandhi. 
and mm -hmm. even, even the dust could crush him. So it's this idea that uh, we need to be more humble than the dust mm -hmm. to 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 even have a even have an inkling of, of truth of, of what truth is. Um, mm -hmm. I think that sometimes um, sometimes when we make mistakes or when others make mistakes they help us become more humble and they help us to understand the world better. <laughs> Mistakes do not die after they're made, but settle in every corner of our lungs. Only in the deepest sleep will the truth come like a worm to eat away at the kernel of your worth. It shows itself as an empty house you didn't know you owned. A place kept from you by the one you love, cornered with dark and the pulverized living. Signifies why again and again you wake, choking in particles of dry dust. Take a broom into your dreams and sweep. Let them spiral around one another, contained in this shaft of light, a sad miracle in their multitudes and go furnish your house with homely things invite people in thank you thank you thank you very much becky wonderful wonderful let us start from um uh, where again we'll have um just we'll read perhaps one poetry by each poet. Uh, and, and this is the concluding, concluding poem. Vera, you are on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's... that's fine, yeah. Okay, um, it's called At the Pinnacle of Love. Paused at the pinnacle of love, beholding its radiant, endless beauty, beguiling like birth and intoxicating like death, I breathed in centuries in one blissful moment and saw that mountains are Earth's very slow waves. One day I'll give birth to a delightful water creature a seahorse caught in my marine foamy nets, floating above your snow-melted peaks, by then submerged in my nauseous, fertile depths. The sky will be in decay, and apologizing to the gloomy clouds, Venus will swirl in its downward farewell waltz. I'll keep my surface blank and swirling in a tide will forgive the mischievous planet for every one of your crusty faults. I'm still encased in days and nights, a season's collector who marks falling leaves in autumn with salt granules on her cheeks. I'll keep this summer plucked flower between Dante's pages at the height of my herbarium's most burning prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Laura Potts, your concluding poem. Friday. The evening of your days, I remember always on the other side of a hospice night. A funeral in my face, your ghost candled father light, still laughing, bright, white in the winter of your age. The world in your ember days lit up its lights in a biblical rain. Long and far, the crack of the night in that dark throbbing room showed your four metal war arms, your eyeballs, stars. The night jars were still, 
and did not stir you, when death in his formal garden took the bones of my grandfather, took the hissing skin that brimmed with disease in all the mist of that morning, the dawn at the edge of his sleep, something lost, lost and gone. Your terminal cry I heard long. After that, the morning hours ran on. In a dawn darkly, on a singing white page at the rim of my memory, the long wartime age of your history I swore. Your lost laugh, your long love, all the days of your life, and never your death at all. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Gerald, the last poem. Um, the, this poem, um, I, yeah, I wrote this poem for my grandfather and um, yes, it's tight, tight is grandfather in Welsh language. Como cervatillo de leva enfurecido, mi abuelo se levantaba. Encendía el horno, aventando sueños, para que las sombras se fueran y la noche los colgara en sus tendales. Amasaba cometas de harina, de agua, de levadura, de sal. Las estrellas del pueblo lo escuchaban cada noche moldear el cielo diurno entre sus manos con la misma persistencia con la que su abuelo picaba en las minas de carbón. Mientras leudaba la masa, fumaba a escondidas de mi abuela bajo la alameda, sus dedos pequeños y adormecidos. Después de unas horas, un bullicio de espigas eran sus campanas y los panes germinaban en las cestas de mimbre donde volaba de niña como en aerolitos. Así acontecían los días en un pueblo fuera de esferas. A menudo desentierro recuerdos como niños vivos. Solo había un reposo mientras leudaba la masa. Fumaba bajo la alameda, escondidas de la abuela, y el humo volaba como bellotas de lana negra. Cuando niña, pensaba que se había ido. Mi madre no quería que lo viera muerto. A veces pienso estas cosas, y me quedo en silencio. Mi abuelo fue más que un hombre que madruga. Escribió las partituras mismas de los sueños. Encendió las bombillas de las cosas perfectas. Los domingos de luz. Cuando me pregunten quién fue mi abuelo, le diré que es el sastre único de todas las luciérnagas. Hoy he visto pasar a un hombre parecido a él. A veces el viento es fecundo cartero. La noche es más espesa y mi abuela duerme y lo sueña y lo encuentra sin más gobiernos y leyes que su luz dando cuerda a nuestros corazones. Thanks. <clears throat> many, 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 many thanks. Many, many thanks.
Jilant. A Shahida she moved from Bangladesh wrote wonderful. Naomi Laura said fantastic. Many thanks to those who already uh, have joined and uh, witnessed uh, this session of breathtaking performance, breathtaking beauty of spoken word. I'm sure this session was equally meditative for the audiences, uh, uh, the artistry in, in, in the poetry, in the poems, and equally the way it was presented, the performance, to me, just amazing. Many, many thanks who have joined. Gaby, would like to add your concluding note, if that's okay? Yeah, yeah so uh, I loved uh, everything of uh, this uh, series. Um, I would love, uh, I, I like, I really liked the question about uh, if poetry uh, can influence the masses, if I'm saying it right. Mm -hmm. I, I, really, I love that question because it triggers so many things. And in the last, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years, I've been trying to like uh, open poetry for uh, more people, like to make people interested in poetry. And that's why I created a podcast and different things and a magazine and events and all. Uh, and sometimes I find uh, that when you, when you do something big with poetry, uh, people mm -hmm. say things like, but that's popular, it's not serious. And, and that's mm -hmm. when I realized that poetry is still being, I mean, not in the whole world, but at least in some countries, is still being very elitist. Uh, and I think uh, these uh, sort of meetings, uh, uh, serious talks uh, are so good to, to try to break that, uh, to try to break the distance uh, and try to make people interested in poetry. And so I, I just would like to say thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to be here. Thank you for uh, ACMEL to create this amazing space. Um, and also we, we, we are all uh, women here as well. And that's also amazing. Uh, so thank you very much. So many, many thanks, KB. This, yeah, so you, this is a very important question. And uh, uh, although it may sound like a uh, Russian um, terminology art for art's sake, but I would like to always uh, like to echo uh, that one of my favorite poets, uh, African poets, uh, says on this, he was asked whether, uh, almost similar question, whether poetry uh, influences uh, masses. And he just straight answered, I'm not a Jesus Christ. So that perhaps says all, and th that is my view in uh, about literature and the art form. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone has their own view. Uh, and many, many thanks. We could, um, I mean, Gaby is a wonderful poet as well. I was tempted to read something from my poetry, but perhaps next time. Many, many thanks. You all are so beautiful poets. It was amazing experience to explore the beauty of spoken words that you weep, uh, especially the poetry you weep. Uh, Bigronti is um, predominantly a South Asian uh, a platform for South Asian literature, poetry, uh, philosophy, uh, but it also uh, promotes global poetry, poetry of the globe, uh, uh, and uh, the philosophies, uh, so you know the any any kind of groundbreaking thoughts. Uh, so uh, and then also it hosts International Poetry Festival in London. Uh, it was supposed to happen in. Uh, many different venues this year, but for COVID, uh, we had to postpone, uh, but definitely it will continue uh, uh, um, after, after this pandemic uh, goes over, uh, it will continue uh, with uh, that International Poetry Festival. Please, please, please uh, keep an eye on Grunty's page uh, to be updated about our future events. Uh, and the uh, next session is with a, a wonderful poet, Claire, and a powerful writer from Leeds. 
Sri Ganguly. Uh, and that is happening on 22nd of uh, this month, Monday. So please stay tuned. And many, many thanks, Vera. Many thanks, Becky. Many thanks. Your input was so beautiful, so beautiful, trust me. Uh, and then I was uh, tempted to ask you and, you know, uh, engage, in more, engage in with more questions, more feedback, but time is limited. Uh, but we at least raised some questions uh, in this forum. Many, many thanks, Gerald. Many thanks, Laura, many thanks. for participating, uh, for joining and reading. See you soon again. Have a wonderful rest of the evening and please stay in poetry. Thank you.